Hello everyone, welcome to the GOE Ecologist. I am Dr. Krishnanand and you have been watching my videos on various topics of geography, environment and research methodology on my channel, the GOE Ecologist. If you are new to this channel, consider subscribing our channel as we are going to cover each and every topic related to geography. Now, in today's session on world regional geography, we are going to look into the East Asian realm or the East Asian region. But before we go ahead, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and please share the videos with others as well. So now let's discuss about the East Asian realm. If you can see clearly in the map, this is the area we are talking about and this is on the Pacific Ocean coast that lies this particular area of East Asia and here Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Pakistan, India these are the bordering neighboring countries of this region Nepal, Bhutan so what you have in between is China, Mongolia then you can see North Korea, South Korea, Japan and also Taiwan. So we are going to look into these particular countries, this particular region. East Asia is encircled by snow-capped mountains. So this is where the snow-capped mountains Himalayan region is over here. And then vast deserts and Pacific waters. So desertic condition is out here. And then you have the Pacific water. These are the three major aspects of this realm. Then East Asia was one of the world's earliest cultural hearths. Remember Chinese civilization, very important. And China is one of the world's oldest continuous civilization that has been there in the studies. Now, East Asia is second most populous geographic realm in the world apart from South Asia. So remember, population is one of the biggest factors that is important in this particular realm. Then let's observe few more points. The People's Republic of China, PRC as we know, is the heart of this particular region, right? So world's largest demographic country and also current rendition of an empire that has has expanded from this particular Central Asia to the Pacific coast. This is the largest empire if you observe from ancient times and in today's world the People's Republic of China is a huge area almost equal to United States of America in terms of area if you observe. Post Mao economic transformation that we say that has led to great leap forward in China's economy if you observe carefully what has happened the China's eastern seaboard this particular eastern coast of China has become one of the most sought after places for world economics and then widening of the Chinese horizon and regional disparities alongside of it, it is important in this particular region. So if you observe the massive urbanization and population increase is one of the things that is problematic in terms of climate change, it's having vulnerabilities and also in terms of pandemic that you observed. So Japan's economy continues to be ranked as one of the most affluent economies, wealthiest economies in the world that lies in this particular realm. And if you observe carefully, geopolitically this area is one of the most important areas in the world remember the countries like North Korea South Korea the divide is here then you have China and Japan issues in South China Sea and several others let's understand one of the important aspects of geographically looking into the realm is climate of the realm so if you observe the climatic division after the Koppen so if you observe carefully short dry season this AM and then you have AW, dry winters. So if you observe carefully AM and AW, you have in the southern tip, this particular areas are AM, AW, that is around the 20 degree latitudes here. And then as you move up 30, 40 and 50, as we move towards the temperate belt, this is the huge desertic condition that exists here in the western and northwestern part of this realm, if you observe carefully, right? And then eastern portions, if you observe, CFA is here. So mostly no dry season, mostly humid areas you will observe. And then this CFA and DFB, if you observe so no dry season but humid and cold climate is there and also dry winters you'll observe in most of the parts now let's look into some of the rivers of this particular realm so if you observe the entire china and adjoining areas are drained by several rivers most of the rivers originating on the himalayan region and tibetan plateau so if you observe carefully the western china here is the tarim river then here if you come indus river originates brahmaputra river which is called sangpo that originates out here and apart from this, if you observe carefully, you have Salvin River, Mekong River, Yangtze River, Yalong River. All these rivers 
originating out here in the Tibetan plateau in the high mountains in Himalayan region, right? And then if you observe the Yangtze River travels all the way out here to this particular eastern coast and it is accompanied by many other rivers like Min River, Han River, Huai River, which is its left bank tributary and on the right bank, Xiang River, Gan River. So this is how this is one of the biggest catchment areas if you observe the Yangtze River catchment area and in the north if you observe the Yellow River, the Huangho River which is also known by the name Sorrow of China. This is the thing that is right from the ancient times we have observed. The color is yellow because of the lowest deposits coming from the Gobi Desert depositing in this water. So these are the major rivers and few rivers like Irrawaddy and others also are transnational. They go to Myanmar, then you have the Mekong River going to the Myanmar and Thailand area, then you have rivers going to Laos and Vietnam, right? So this is important here. And one more river that you observe is the Pearl River. So largely these are the river systems that are there in this particular realm. Then let's observe one more important point that it's not just about river systems being there, but these rivers are carrying lot of sediment load right from the Tibetan Plateau all the way to the Pacific and Indo-Pacific region. So lot of sediment accumulation is happening here which is very interesting in terms of geomorphology if you can observe on the map here right so now comes the population geography of this area which is very important and prominent feature in the world world's highest population till date is in China and you see the eastern China highly dominated river valleys and eastern coast very high population in this particular region and this data is of 2017 but still this is the leading population realm in the world and after that the South Asian region is there so if you observe carefully these are the energy resources that are available in this particular region so gas fields oil fields coal fields pipelines definitely they are the major drivers of the economy and also look at the resources in terms of the metals so you have antimony copper iron lead manganese mercury you name it molybdenum tin and even tungsten is found in this particular realm from the western portions here in the Tian Shan belt Tarim basin to the northern northeastern portions of China as well as the eastern portions if you observe the entire region apart from that Taiwan and Japan and also some portions in North Korea are endowed with rich resources in terms of these mineral and oil resources then if you observe carefully the next important feature of this region is the linguistic plurality lot of language and ethnic diversity so if you observe Han Chinese is this color that represents here mostly this area the old China that you say right the Han Chinese this one right right from the Manchu here and then in the north you have Mongolian right the seat of Mongoloid and then you have the Turkic here Tajik here and this is the Tibetan region right and here you have the Tibetan language then further this area now is a amalgamation of multiple so if you observe here what is available north main south main hakka xiang gan thai right and then you have several others like monkhomer as well this particular green belt if you observe so that is important here then here you have the japanese language in japan and han language again in taiwan so this is where the linguistic plurality is observed in this particular realm now let's observe the great wall of china which is one of the outstanding features and also it features in the world heritage sites and also one of the wonders of the world so if you remember this is here part of the Han China that you say this wall is like this and purpose of this wall was precisely to protect people from the attacks from the north that is the tribes from Mongolia so this was created here and this is Beijing where you'll find it the capital and from here it extends till this point 8th to 5th centuries BC this was when it was mostly constructed and the dynasties like Qin, Wei, Zhao then you have Qi, Han, Yan and Zongshan dynasties. They have actually created and constructed this. So if you observe, this is the one of the features which is human feature but a large feature covering huge area in China. Now let's look into the political divisions especially of China. So let's go to the west if you observe this particular region is called Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. Then next as they call it Zizang province that is autonomous region here which is basically Tibetan region and then in the north you will have this Mongol Inner Mongolia Autonomous Region. Apart from this in the down south also you will find this autonomous region here 
Zhuang, and then rest of the China is the original China, as we say, or we say the core belt of China, right? Then let's observe further about the GDP in terms of the cities and their population in China. So what you observe, the maximum GDP is concentrated on the East Coast, and that is what we say is the major industrial belt in China, special economic zones are there. So if you observe million plus cities with also the economy booming in gradually because of the special economic zones and to observe that we'll have the regions of East China carefully if you observe. So China's coastal core, this particular belt is the coastal core of China, which is having maximum population concentration and special economic zones and is the base and heart of this economic region if you observe. And then you have the interior China and other areas. So one by one, let's divide the region and understand carefully what is the speciality of one region. So first one here is China's coastal core. This is what you see in the color coastal core. So right from the Shenyang to Beijing to Tianjin to Nanjing to Shanghai, Hangzhou, then you have Shenzhen, Guangzhou, then you have in the south you have the Kunming, in the west you have Langzhou, right? So all these provinces if you observe this particular belt is the main eastern coastal core belt of China which is very important for global economy. And in simple ways, we can say this is the heart of China. Then let's look into the special economic zones, which are very famous. So Hong Kong and Shenzhen special economic zone, if you observe carefully, this is where it is lying. And this is one of the areas which is heavily industrialized and corporate offices are there. So if you observe, this is Hong Kong, this is Shenzhen area, this province, and this is the special economic zone municipality in green color, if you observe carefully. So here is the Mears Bay, here is Pearl River Estuary, then other features you can observe this is a little broken island chains out here right so this is the major special economic zone in China and government introduced this special economic zone to boost and attract the investments as usual and now it has become world's hub of economics then if you observe further China's northeastern portion has a lot of natural endowments like coal and oil deposits if you observe carefully near the Harbin and also this is heavily agricultural zone so if you observe corn, soybeans and other production are heavily concentrated in this area, majorly in this particular belt and also minerals are available right from iron ore to copper, lead, zinc and others. So this is one of the emerging areas of Northeast China which is also sharing the borders with Russia and has East Sea that is Sea of Japan as the coastal area. Now let's look into the second aspect of this realm that is China's interior and this area if you observe this particular area is called China's interior. So this is coastal seaboard and this is China's interior right from Langzhou to this Hexi corridor and that connects Xinjiang and other provinces to China. So if you observe the expansionist tradition of China is moving from this core China to the west and this is the outskirts that we say and this is heavily growing area in the region today. So if you observe a lot of developmental activities are happening and China's policy of go west is actually leading to the development in this particular region. Now if you observe further China western periphery where you have this autonomous region as we talked about Zhejiang region that is the Tibetan region that we say and it is dominated by the Buddhist population which was overtaken in 1959 if you remember and then the other one this is the Uyghur Muslims area which you know by the name of Xinjiang province now Let's observe this western periphery in a little more detail that what is available here, what are the things, why China is more interested in this region. So this is again giving economic benefits in terms of a lot of irrigated farming happening, a lot of oil fields if you observe, these are the oil fields here. The Tarim Basin is very famous for this and that's why China is looking for a lot of developmental activities and remember they have an economic corridor planned through Pakistan which is connecting the Tarim Basin here which is very interesting. Now, let's look into the northern part of this realm, which is Mongolia, a deserted country, which is having Altai mountains out here, Hangian mountains out here, and then Gobi desert here, Mongolian Plateau out here. So most of the land is deserted, barren, mountainous, and most of the tribes are poverty ridden. And earlier, remember, these tribes were once dreaded tribes from Mongolia, which used to attack the Central Asia as well as China. So this is one of the regions, and it's a landlocked country, a poor country. And remember, 
remember Ulaanbaatar is the capital out here and they are dependent on their trade for China as well as Russia because they are landlocked completely. Now if you observe the other zone here is the North and South Korea that is major part of this realm. So we say Korean Peninsula. So Korean Bay is out here. Then this is the line which divides the ceasefire line here, right? This is Pangyong Island here. And as you go south, you'll have the Yellow Sea out here. Then this is Korean Strait here. Busan is important South Korean city. Then Seoul is the capital city out here in the north, Pyongyang. And this area is the border between China. Here is the East Sea of Japan, right? So this is the Korean Peninsula which is divided into North and South Korea but wait this is important to understand here that once China supported North Korea as you can see and the West that is America and others supported South Korea and South Korea when built is having a lot of industrial area apart from being rugged mountain area in some portions they have fertile agricultural land and also a lot of minerals available but North Korea if you see the installments look at this particular belt out here what is here nuclear installations rocket factories these are the places where they are making ammunitions and that's why we say north korea is a rogue nation many times isn't it so if you observe these are the installations out there now let's look into japan and very important country in terms of pacific as well as the east asian country and has been part of developed nations since earlier days so if you observe the hokkaido the northern portion northern province then you have the honshu you have tokyo out here as you go down south you have osaka then you have shikoku then you have Kyushu. So these are certain provinces of Japan if you observe from north to south and what is very important is the affluence of Japan and the work culture that is very famous and you see the Kuril Islands. This is a disputed territory here with Russia as well, the Kuril Islands. If you observe carefully, this particular is the epicenter of March 11, 2011 earthquake that triggered the tsunami if you observe and then there are certain closed nuclear power plants if you observe. So these closed nuclear power plants are nearby Sendai and others are also near this Fukuoka province. Apart from that, we already have active power plants heavily in this core belt. If you observe, this is the core Japanese belt that we observe. Now let's look into the nearby areas. So East Sea, the Sea of Japan here, this is North Korea. Here is the Pacific Ocean. Blue color that you say this coastline, which you say is highly affected with tsunami, right? Then look into this tsunami section of Japan and why is it there so? So through geological structure, we can understand. This is Eurasian plate out here. In between you have this Japan, this particular area here, right? Sendai, Fukushima, Tokyo and this area because of the Pacific plate here and subduction zone here, ring of fire here, lot of earthquakes. You look at the swarm of earthquakes, the dots that are there. So this is active tectonic plate and because of that, this area is regularly jolted by the earthquake if you observe carefully, right? So here is the Philippine plate. So these two, three plates, North American plate, Pacific plate, Eurasian plate and Philippine plate. In between you have Japan. So it's a wonderful area if you observe in terms of natural standards. And then with such tectonic influence, look at the development of Japan, what they have done. So that's a really commendable effort and the best example of possibilism that we say in geography. Then if you observe Taiwan, a very small island country and which was bifurcated from mainland China and they declared themselves independent Chinese and the word is Taiwan they use and here is the Chungyang Mountains out here then you have Taiwan Strait which is away from China and then you have the Philippine Sea here and the down south you have Luzon Strait South China Sea and Taiwan's capital is Taipei out here in the north and this northern coastal northern western coastal area is heavily populated area and remember China the mainland Chinese always say that they are wayward province because they separated themselves and declared themselves out of China as the main China right the original Chinese that's the history behind it. Then if you observe East Asian political crisis that we talked about, so there is a lot of conflict in the region. That's why many times instability is visible. So if you observe geopolitical flashpoints, where are the flashpoints? One is between North Korea and South Korea. This area border conflicts keep happening. Then the next major problem that's happening right now is the claim of these Southeast China Sea. Most of them is claimed by China and few of them is claimed by Japan and most of these islands are being inhabited by 
Chinese, they have their naval bases out here, oil and gas fields are there. So majorly South China Sea has a lot of oil and natural gas and China is trying to take control of it as we can say and they claim it to be their own territory and they have conflict with Japan and neighboring islands as well. So this is one of the areas which is of importance in this particular realm. So now when we have covered various aspects of the East Asian realm in today's session, in the sessions to come, we'll be looking into the other aspects of world regional geography. So stay tuned, stay safe, keep watching and learning and don't forget to subscribe to our channel and please share the videos with others as well.